And for 10 years, I worked with junior high students. And during that time period, uh, I got to take them on mission trips. And one of the places that we frequented quite a bit was the city of San Francisco and got to know that city really well, how to navigate through it, where to drive, where not to drive, got to meet some, some really interesting people. Uh, in San Francisco, by Golden Gate Park, there's a part of the park that's called the Panhandle, and it's in the, the Hay and Ashbury District. And uh, it's a very popular part of the city to live. Uh, the, the, the houses and the condos are very expensive. Everything that, that you uh, need is, is right there within walking distance. And if you have to go further than walking distance, public transportation is right there. You could hop on a bus and go anywhere that you want. There was a, a young and upcoming couple that wanted to buy a house in this area. And, and as they looked, they fell in love with a beautiful 850 square foot condo uh, in this area by the panhandle. And uh, it had a yard, if you could call it that. Their, their, their yard was a 10 by 10 slab of concrete uh, that actually, when they first were looking at the house, it was filled with garbage and debris because the bus stop was just down the street from them. And this yard didn't have a fence of any sort, and so everything just got swept into this area. But when the couple walked and they, they saw this, this house, this condo, they fell in love because they envisioned what it would be like to, to dig up the concrete and to put a fence around this yard and, and to put a fully enclosed greenhouse inside of this 10 by 10 space. And they would put flowers and have built-in speakers and have a little fountain flowing in the corner. This place would have their sanctuary, a place for them to get away and to, and to rest and to kind of uh, to, to rejuvenate their life and have a new picture on life. And so at the close of escrow, they hired some contractors to come in and, and they dug out the concrete. And, and they had some professionals come in and they put up a fence, an eight foot fence all the way around this yard. And they had other professionals come in and make a glass greenhouse that was fully enclosed in the yard. And they had landscapers come in and, and they put in flowers and built a fountain. It was absolutely gorgeous. When they came home, they could open up the sliding glass door to their backyard and they could go inside of this greenhouse and just breathe breathe and be at peace. Uh, the wife was, was really wanting to enjoy her sanctuary after a very tough day at work. And on the way home, she was riding the bus and she was thinking about what life would be like just sitting on her bench, listening to some music and just debriefing and breathing. And she gets home and she puts her purse on the counter and she walks out into the backyard, opens the glass door, goes inside of the greenhouse, only to discover that a family of rats had moved in. And they were big ones. And they were just scourging around the plants and, and digging into things and it was completely messing up her garden. Immediately the couple called the exterminator. And the exterminator came out and analyzed the situation and said, well, I, I could put out some traps and I could put some poison out and, and that'll help for a little bit, but really, you're not gonna be able to get rid of these things. More and more are going to come. The problem is the foundation to this greenhouse. The rats are digging underneath it and they're gonna to continue to dig underneath it and invade your sanctuary. If you wanna get rid of them, you have to dig deeper. And so the couple looked at their budget and, and what they were going to do, and they called the professional out again. And he disassembled the greenhouse piece by piece. And they dug deeper into the foundation and put the greenhouse back together piece by piece. That lasted three days. The rats took them longer, but they dug deeper and got into the greenhouse and they brought their friends and it was more infested than what it was before. When they called the exterminator back out, he said the same thing. If you wanna get rid of them, you have to dig deeper. And so they dug down seven feet. They had to get permits and make sure that they didn't hit gas lines and anything else. They dug down seven feet and poured concrete and then built this thing back up piece by piece. And finally, they got rid of the rats. 
during this Christmas season, there are many of us who wrestle with fear. There are many of us during the season where fear creeps into our lives and the solution for us is to dig deeper. We have to dig deeper into the gospel of Jesus Christ. During this Christmas season, there are people um, who remember family members who are not with us anymore. And somehow during this season, we think about our own mortality and fear creeps in. We have to dig deeper. There are some people who have health issues and, and, and you wonder, how long do I have to deal with this pain that I'm going through? Fear creeps in and we wonder, is this pain gonna last forever? Is it ever going to weigh? There are people in this room who are wrestling through family circumstances. Fear creeps in because there are family members who you dearly love, who are not making good choices in their life. Fear creeps in when we wonder if the bills are gonna get paid, if there's gonna be a layoff in the future, or if we could keep up the good work that we have been doing next year. Fear creeps in when we worry about failing, when we worry about success. Fear creeps in when we do not have control and we do not know what's going to happen. Fear creeps in for many reasons. Politics, isolation, being underappreciated, discomfort, betrayal, divorce, change, spiders, and I could go on and on. When fear creeps in, we need to dig deeper into the gospel of Jesus. When we plant our lives in the grace of Jesus, some of us might think, hey, that's it, I've arrived. I've asked Jesus to come into my life. I put my faith and my trust in him, and everything should be great. But very soon, fear and anxiety come creeping in. You might ask, what's wrong? We have the fullness of God. What, what's missing in my life? Why are these fears creeping in? We have to dig deeper into what's already there. When we do, it might take longer, but here come those fears again and the anxieties all over again, and they're bringing new ones with them. We have to dig deeper. Though delayed and in different form, they evade again and again. We have to dig deeper, deeper into the preciousness of grace, deeper into the bottomless fullness of what our Lord Jesus has given to us. We must dig deeper so that the fear of our Lord stands taller and taller in our lives. And the anxiety and the fear of our hearts are blocked out and relieved. Today we're gonna to look at what the Bible says about fear. Specifically, we're gonna look at two gardens and how fear takes place in both of these gardens. But before I do, I'd like to, to put out some definitions. Um, there, there are two types of fear that are mentioned in the Bible. The first kind of fear is the fear of God. This is the type of fear that, that means to stand in reverent respect. It is to be in awe and wonder. Martin Luther describes this fear like a son has for a loving father. The son loves the father. He loves the father so much that the son is willing to submit his will to do what the father thinks is right. So this morning when I talk about the fear of God, I, I want you to think about a loving God. I want you to think about fearing God is the same thing as putting God first in your life, of standing before him in reverence and in awe and worship and going, yes, God, your way is the best way. God, you could do whatever you want. You have the power. You have the control. We see this type of fear in uh, Proverbs 1.7. It says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and destruction. When, when you hear that, I want you to think about loving God is the beginning of knowledge. Being in awe and reverent respect to God is the beginning of knowledge. Moses writes in Deuteronomy 6, 2, he said that God gave us the law so that we might fear him and live long. So think about God gave us the law so that we might stand in awe of who he is, that we might have reverent respect for what he's doing in and around us, and that we might have a long life. Later, Moses writes in Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 12, he asks, what does the Lord your God require of you? To fear him. 
The Lord your God requires that you fear him, to walk in all of his ways, to love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul. The Hebrew word for this type of fear is yoktheo, and it is repeated 150 times in just the Psalms alone. And connected with this word are the promises like the loving kindness is with those who fear the Lord. And forgiveness comes for those who fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is putting God in his proper place as creator, sustainer, and redeemer of this world. There is no one like God. And he is beyond us. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are higher than our ways. And when we, when we could scratch the surface of who God is, we are filled with fear of him reverent, loving awe that he is the creator. The second fear that the Bible talks about is more common to us. It's, it's what we, we think about when we think about the word fear. Martin Luther calls it servile fear. He says that this type of fear is that, is that what a prisoner has when he's looking upon his torturer. It's, it's fearing the worst case scenario. It's fearing the unknown. It's fearing that you are not going to get what is best. And we see both of these fears play out in the Garden of Eden. So let's dig deeper into the gospel this morning and turn to Genesis. We're going to be looking at Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Genesis 1 and 2, as you read it, we, we get a vision for the kingdom that provides for everything. It's a vision of abundance with God being present. There is not a hint of fear with God dwelling among his creation. The text describes a very intimate vision of a genuine love relationship throughout all things. In Genesis chapters 1 and chapter 2, we see a perfect relationship between mankind and God. We see a perfect relationship between man and woman. And we also see a perfect relationship between mankind and every other created thing. Everything worked together in harmony without fear in Genesis 1 and 2 because there was no sin. And in this loving relationship that God had with his creation, he was very intimate. We see this in Genesis chapter 1. God did not just speak mankind into existence. No, he, he got his hands dirty. He, he rolled up his sleeves and he dug down into the dirt and he formed man in his very own image. And then what's more, instead of just making him and zap, there was man. He got in close and he breathed into him the breath of life, like a kiss, coming in extremely close and breathing his own breath into his creation. He does the very same thing with woman. Man, Adam goes asleep, God takes a rib out of his side and begins to, to form it and to mold it into the image of woman, the perfect spouse for Adam. And, and God reaches down and he breathes life into her. He is an intimate, loving God that has a special relationship with his creation. We, we see that, that God loves his creation so much that he takes Adam and he takes Eve and he places them into a garden filled with beauty and abundance. Genesis chapter 2, verse 9, if you look at this with me, it says, Out of the ground the Lord God made spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. This garden was not just functional. This garden was absolutely beautiful. God put trees in the garden that are pleasant to the sight. It was gorgeous and it was functional. God is providing for his creation by giving them beauty and giving them everything that they need in order to survive. If you read with me in verse 10, you'll see that, that God in this garden is, is full of abundance. He loves his creation so much that he wants to give them everything. Verse 10 says, a river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. And you might be going, how does that say that? Well, I like to fish. Raise your hand if you're a fisherman like me. You, yeah, okay. We gotta talk about spots. 
But in, in this neighborhood, in this area, in Northern California, uh, let's look at Sacramento. In Sacramento, we have two major rivers. We have the American River and we have the Sacramento River. The American River flows into the Sacramento River. Which one's bigger? Take a guess, shout it out. What's bigger, the American River or the Sacramento River? Sacramento River is bigger. The American River flows into it. And there's other water sources that flow into the Sacramento River. The Sacramento River is wider and it's deeper. There's big boats and things that, that travel on the Sacramento River. The American River is not as deep. Sacramento flows into the Delta, which is even bigger than the Sacramento River. If you were to, to, to go up the American River and you were to track its source, you would see, and I've done this, first-hand knowledge, you would see that there's a whole bunch of, of small streams that flow into the American River. It gets smaller and smaller as you go to the source. But here in the garden, we see a, a very different picture. We see that in the garden, there is a river that waters the garden, but it doesn't just do that. It feeds four major rivers. This is a picture in the garden of God's abundance, that, that he is pouring out water out of this garden to feed these other areas. And, and just like this picture in the garden, God is an abundant God who loves his creation. He continues to pour out in our life to feed us, and it's never ending. It's this bottomless, bottomless source that continues to flow and to flow and to flow in our life. God is so good, and he loves his creation that he wants to give them everything that they need. He wants to put them in this beautiful garden filled with abundance. But that's not it. God is so intimate with his creation that he communicates with his creation. He communicates with man and woman. In Genesis 3, verse 8, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. Adam and Eve were familiar with the sound of God. The way the texts read, it seems like this is a normal experience. So at, at the end of Genesis 1, we see that, that God made Adam and Eve, he made mankind, he said, this is very good. And then he says, you too will have dominion over everything that lives and breathes on this earth. You will have dominion over the fish uh, over the sea and the fish that lives in them. You will have dominion over the air and everything that lives in it. You will have dominion over the land and everything that lives in it. God is communicating with his creation and he invites them to participate with them. He tells them, I want you to be fruitful and to multiply and, and to expand into the outermost areas of this world. He, he is talking with them. In Genesis chapter 2, we see that God allows Adam to be part of what his creation, this, this all-creating God who made everything and made the animals and he made mankind and he made everything, gives Adam the job of being creative too. Adam gets to come in and come up with all these different names and assign them to all these different creatures. God is communicating with his creation because he's intimate, he's close, he's loving. God also commands his creation. He not only does he say, be fruitful and to multiply, but in Genesis chapter two, verses 16 and 17, it says, and the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of any tree in the garden, but the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat of. For the day that you do, you will surely die. This command was the only boundary that humanity had in paradise. It was the one place in this vast garden where humanity was confronted with the question, do I love God? Do I love him enough to obey? Do I love him enough to do what he asks? Adam and Eve were confronted with this decision in Genesis chapter 3. Now, you probably know that every loving relationship requires trust and choice. Relationships thrive when we could trust one another. And oftentimes, when trust is broken, the relationship fails. When I was first married, I had it in me that I couldn't tell my wife about my failures and about the, the struggles that I was facing. I, I justified that by, by saying that she doesn't want to hear the things that I'm going through. She doesn't want to hear the negative. 
I only want to tell her the positive things and, and keep this relationship happy. What I quickly learned is that when I withheld my feelings and what I was thinking and what I was afraid of, my wife saw that as a sign that I didn't trust her. And she was right. Every relationship requires honesty and openness with all of our lives, the good and the bad. Relationships also require choice. Every day, my wife and I choose to be married to one another. We choose to interact with other people in our lives as well. We choose to engage with, with friends and family members. We choose to be in loving relationship with others. And the same is true with God. Even with God, relationships require trust and choice. The tree of the knowledge of good and evil provided an opportunity for Adam and Eve to trust and to choose God. Do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For in the day that you do, you shall surely die. The word knowledge in Hebrew is different than our Western understanding of knowledge. Uh, it's, it's, in Hebrew, knowledge doesn't mean facts and data, but, but knowledge is associated with experience. And in essence, Adam and Eve could not experience evil because they were completely dependent on God and what God had for them. They were in awe and wonder of the Lord. They loved him, and their only fear that they had was the fear of God, the first fear that we talked about, which was, was respecting him and going, wow, what are you going to do next? However, in Genesis 3, a serpent enters the scene and provides another voice. And Adam and Eve were forced to make a choice. Read with me in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. The serpent said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, You shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and the tree was desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. As the serpent speaks, he sowed seeds of fear into the minds of Adam and Eve. Before this, life was very good. They were living in abundance with God. But as the serpent spoke, he be, they began to doubt of what they had seen and heard, of what they know to be true, and they had to make a choice. If you're taking notes with us this morning, the serpent sows three doubts into their mind. The first one is, is God's word true? And Adam and Eve begin to wrestle with the fear, is God's word really true? Let's look at the lie that the serpent tells Eve in verse 5. He starts off by saying, you will not surely die. In this one sentence, he challenges God. He's saying to Eve, God has lied to you. Because we know in Genesis 2.17 that God said, if you eat of this fruit, surely you will die. And now the serpent is coming and saying, surely you will not die. And we deal with the same lie every single day. Perhaps you're sitting here this morning and you've recently asked yourself, is God's word true? Will God do what he promises that he will do? Is believing in Jesus really the answer to abundant life? Am I going to go to heaven when I die because of my faith in Jesus Christ? Is God going to follow through with his promises? Are his words true? And just like that, Doubt and fear creep in. Can I really trust God? Is he who he says he is? The second lie, the second doubt that the serpent tells is, is God really all I need? The serpent says, surely you will not die, for the Lord knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. 
The heart of the statement is that God is withholding something from you. God doesn't want you to eat of this fruit because if you do, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. First off, Adam and Eve were already like God. They were made in the very image of God. But the serpent begins to penetrate their fears and begin to sow these seeds of doubt and begin to make them wonder, is there something else out there that could satisfy them? Is there something else out there besides God that could fill them, that could give them a purpose and to give them a meaning? And now Adam and Eve are faced with a choice. They have to either trust that God's word is true and that God is all they need, or they could go their own way. The third lie, actually before we get there, isn't it true that we also wrestle with this lie in our life, right? There's times in our lives where we think that there is something else other than God that could satisfy us to make us complete. If I could just get that job, then everything will be okay. If, if my kids could, could just go to this school or just behave the right way, then, then everything will be great for their future. If, if I could just get through this busy season in my life, next month, everything's going to be different, even though it wasn't last month and the month before. But, but there's something out there. If I could just do this, then everything will be great. And ultimately, that's the lie of, of the serpent that there's something else out there besides God that could satisfy you, that could complete you. At the root of this, this is the fear that what God has to offer us is not enough. And then there's number three, which is the lie. Does God really love me? If you think about the first two doubts, is God's word true? And is God really all I need? It's not long before the third doubt comes to mind and we begin to question God's love. If God's word is not true, then he has already broken trust with us. And we've already established earlier that in order for us to have relationship, there needs to be trust. And if God is holding back, then he's not all I need. Then there's something else out there that could satisfy God doesn't want the best for me, then it's an obvious conclusion that God doesn't love you. So we think. We're not sure how long Adam and Eve stood there with the serpent, wrestling through their doubts and their fears. But we do know that they did not consult God before they took action. God created them to be in relationship with him, and it was an intimate relationship but they defiled that relationship and they took matters into their own hands. Their actions showed that they, their actions showed that they were fearful that God's word was not enough. Their actions showed that they were fearful that God was not enough. Their actions showed that perhaps God did not love them. And what was sad is it was all a lie. The man and the woman eat the fruit. They trust in their own way. They trust their, in their own way and they do not trust God's love for them. And what's the impact? They believe that they are unlovable as they are. All relationships get ripped apart. Chapter three, verse seven. Then their eyes were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. The first thing that they did was they covered their nakedness with fig leaves. This is a profound act that reveals they sensed something was wrong with the fact that they are naked. They knew that there was something wrong with them and it terrified them. They began to experience this other type of fear. They did not believe that they did not believe that they were lovable as they were and they could no longer be together without experiencing shame and fear. They cover themselves and distance themselves from one another. Sin causes us to hide, and it brings distance into our relationships. A few years ago, there was a guy in, in my community group, 
And when we first got together, everyone introduced who they were. And, and this person said what their name was. And, uh, and we talked and we kind of went through the community group. We, we discussed scripture, we prayed with each other and for each other. And then everyone went off their own week, or off their own way. The next week, uh, everyone comes back together and I forgot his name. And so I, I asked him, I said, can you remind me what your name is? And he told me what his name, and, and we had community group. We, uh, we hung out together. We, we talked about scripture. We prayed with and for each other. And I remembered to pray for him, but I forgot his name shortly after the meeting was over. And, and I began praying for him, uh, God, will you please help my brother in his work situation? Would you work in his life? And I was faithful to pray for him, except I could not remember his name. And so the third week comes around, and, and I ask him one more time, can, can you tell me what your name is, please? I'm sorry, I'm going to write it down, and I wrote it down. I wrote it on my hand, and, and I'm like, I'm going to remember this, I'm going to remember this. And I go throughout the day, and my hand washes off, and I don't remember what his name is again. And so I told myself, I'm not going to ask him anymore what his name was. I was embarrassed that I could not remember his name, and I, I was faithfully praying for him, but I couldn't remember what his name was. Then I go to an event with some friends that are from out of town, and he's there with some of his friends, and I see him across the room, and I'm like, that's so-and-so. And if I engage with him, I'm going to have to introduce him to everyone that I'm with. And I didn't want to ask him what his name was, because at this point, we had already gone through half of our community group together. And so I do what probably most of you would do, is I avoided him. I decided not to make any eye contact and kinda, kinda do my own thing and huddle with my group of people, and I wasn't going to, to make contact with him. Luckily, he saw us and came over and introduced himself to everyone. He said, hi, my name's Craig Hardinger, and... <laughs> it wasn't Craig, but it was another person, and he, he introduced himself to us. And I was relieved of the shame that I felt, the fear that maybe he would reject me if he knew that I had forgotten his name. Maybe he wouldn't think well of me. He wouldn't think that I could be in relationship with him. Sin creates distance in relationship. We cover up, we hide, and we protect ourselves. Adam and Eve sewed fig leaves together and made a loincloth. They could no longer be in the presence of one another without covering themselves. They felt like there was something bad in the root of who they are. And so they took leaves and they put them together as if that would make them better, to present them in a better light. Not only was their relationship distorted, but the relationship between mankind and God was also distorted. In Genesis 3, verse 8, it says, And they heard the sound of the Lord walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees in the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. First, they literally hid. Both of them hid someplace in the garden as if God didn't know that they were missing, if God didn't know where they were. God knew exactly where they were. He's God. But because he's a loving and gracious God, he calls out to them by name. Adam, Eve, where are you? Adam. Eve, where are you? And finally, Adam speaks up and says, we're here. I heard you coming, and so I hid. The sin in their life made them fear that they weren't worthy of God's love anymore. And they ran away from God. We also see them hiding by shifting blame. When God questions Adam in verse 11, he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? 
The man said, the woman whom you gave me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. And, and in one sentence, Adam blames God and Eve for what has happened. He's hiding. The woman, God, that you gave me, this is your fault, you gave her to me. She, she it's her fault, she gave me the fruit. He, he's trying to shift the blame instead of taking responsibility for his actions. He, he's giving it to her. He's hiding from God. As if, if God were to realize that it's God's fault and it's woman's fault, that Adam would now be in an okay relationship. But his relationship with God would ever be changed because sin has now entered the world. And Eve does the exact same thing. When, when God questions the woman, uh, he said, what is it that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me, God, and then I ate. She too is going, it's, it's not my fault, it's someone else's. Both of them continue to hide, even in conversation with God, by putting blame on someone else. If you keep reading, you'll find that in verse 21, God rips an animal apart and skins it to cover humanity's shame. Humanity is then separated from the garden, and life is never the same again. Genesis goes on to record that brother rises up against brother, breaking families into fragments. Languages were confused, and people groups were scattered. Nations declare war against the threat of imperial oppression. The snowball of sin continues to roll forward, growing larger and destroying more of God's creation as it goes. Sin brought with it terrifying fear, which looks like distrust, shame, confusion, and domination. But this is not the end of the story. God sees our fear. He sees our shame. And yes, he still loves you. He loves us, and he takes action. There is another garden in history where fear is confronted. God sent his son Jesus to rescue us from fear and to restore our relationship with him. We celebrate the birth of Jesus as, at Christmas time. Jesus came in the flesh, living and delighting in the perfect fear of the Lord. That fear took him into a garden that was very different than Eden. He was not going there to run from God in a shattered relationship. He came there to run towards his father, to collapse on him in order to face his fears. The gospel writers strained for language to present Jesus' experience in Gethsemane. It, it's not that it's too strong to say that he was fearful, but, but rather it's not strong enough. We find descriptions of unparalleled distress and dreadful anguish, of death of sorrow that is death itself, and the agony so great that his capillaries burst and bloody sweat actually pour from him. And it was all a rational fear. It was a realistic fear. Those fears only intensified by the realities he faced in the garden during this divine conversation. That night in Gethsemane, the only, it's the only occasion in the Bible where it's recorded that Jesus fell prostrate and hid his face. He covers his eyes, and I believe he saw nothing but hell yawning before him. Here is the horror of the one who lived wholly for the Father, facing complete abandonment by him. And he became the very thing that God hates. He became sin itself. And yet of all the accounts of the gospel writers tell us, in spite of that fear and the agony set before him, Jesus embraced the Father's will. He willingly gave up his life. He did this on his own account. He willingly trusted the Father with all of his heart, even when his heart was broken so much stronger in him than all of his fears was the absolute submissive love of the Father and his absolutely unstoppable love for us. Those loves overcame what was overwhelming. 
He went to the cross. He went to the tomb. And we will never have to face his fear because his perfect love casts out all fear. When we embrace forgiveness of Jesus, our fears melt away and we are put in awe and wonder of God all over again. About 10 years ago, there was a man named Chris, a college student that I was mentoring. And there was a time in his life when he was, was really, really struggling with fear in his life. He had been dating a girl for about three years and she had just moved away to go to another college out of state. He had a really good job in Sacramento. He was in ministry, he was helping, and God was doing great things from him. He was plugged into this church and he absolutely loved it. But he was fearful of making the wrong choice. He was fearful that he was going to make the wrong choice and perhaps he would miss out on this relationship that one day might be his wife. He was fearful that he might make the wrong choice and he might pick the wrong career and he might go away and he might miss out on what this job had for him. He was fearful that he wouldn't be able to serve in ministry the way that he was able to at RK Church and that he wouldn't have older people speaking into his life. And I looked across the table from Chris and I said, Chris, don't you know that God loves you? And with tears in his eyes, he looked back at me and he said, I know that God loves me, but I don't think I love him enough. And I said, Chris, this is the lie of Satan. It doesn't matter how we respond to God. God loves you completely in spite of who you are. He sees the poor choices that you've made. He sees everything before you, and he loves you. He sent Jesus Christ to come to this earth to die for you and to raise again so that you could have relationship with him. And together, he casted his fears to the Father. And slowly, his fears began to melt away. That afternoon, Chris and I dug deeper into the gospel of Jesus Christ. We dug deeper into what he already knew, that Jesus came to save him, to rescue him, to show him amazing love that the Father has for him. And when the Father came into perspective, his fears began to melt away. This morning, that is our challenge today. When fears come in from all over the place in our lives, I don't know what they are. We need to dig deeper into the gospel of Jesus Christ. His perfect love for us melts all fears away. It, it, his grace is absolutely amazing. One of my favorite songs is the song Amazing Grace. I'm gonna have Pastor Brian come up and he's going to lead us in that in just a moment. The second verse of this song says, was grace that taught my heart to fear. It was grace that showed me that God is in control. It was grace that showed me that God loves me, that God loves you. He loves you so much that he was willing to sacrifice his own son so that he could be in relationship with you in spite of your sin, in spite of your fear, in spite of your shame. And the song goes, and it is grace that melts, it was grace that taught my heart to fear and grace my fears relieved. When you understand the right perspective of God, that he is worthy of our worship, that he is in awe and he is reverent, our fears melt away. So I'm going to ask you this morning, I don't know where you're at, what, what's going on in your life, but I'm sure that, that there are some people in, in this room that don't know what it's like to have a relationship with God, but you understand what it's like to be in fear. This morning, I'm going to ask you to trust and maybe do something that you've never done before, to, to pray where you're seated and go, God, I'm fearful, I'm scared, I don't know what's going to happen next in my life. Help me to trust you. Help me to see you. Take these fears away. The gospel is clear that when we turn to Jesus Christ, our lives are radically changed.
Maybe you've been following Jesus for quite some time and, and fear is creeping in and, and it's coming back and it's been some time, but fear is coming in and, and it's unsettling things in your home. Dig deeper into the gospel this morning. Trust that God's grace is enough for you. And as you cast your fears on him as Jesus did, he will show you that his love casts out all fear. And maybe you are going strong for the Lord Jesus Christ. Continue to dig deeper into the gospel and share that with other people. Thanks for listening to the Arcade Church Podcast. Visit us at arcadechurchonline.com, Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram. 